Amen. Who are we? We're on the particular emphasis the last few weeks. We are holiness. As Sister Tricia said, we went from the nature to the doctrine to the experience. We've been talking about the lifestyle. Last week, we covered the principle of modesty. And this week, uh, with the help of the Lord, we're going to cover the principle of ornamentation and the principle of the distinction of gender. Before I do, I want to just lay a little bit more foundation here. I'm not going to go all into this. We've done it twice. But the Bible teaches principles. Those are general truths that we can apply to our lives. The Bible teaches principles. And we, though, however, we must apply those principles to everyday living. I'm trying to stay away from it, but, you know, if our nation would just get back to its principles and make judgment by principles and make decisions by principles. But it's one thing to have a principle. It's another thing to apply that to our individual life. Now, I have been careful in this series, not starting last night, uh, Wednesday night, not because uh, we're, we're hesitant to name different things, but the moment you begin to apply this, I'm talking about from my preaching perspective, people begin to want to debate and discuss the application rather than the principle. I'm going to show you how that happens with this illustration here. There is a principle that says, keep the Sabbath holy. By Jesus' time, they weren't talking about keeping the Sabbath holy anymore. They were arguing about the application of that. How many steps should you allow your donkey to take on the Sabbath? Should you fry, scramble, or boil your egg on the Sabbath? And so the discussions were no longer on the principle. This discussion was no longer on the Word of God. The discussion was on the application. And they got far afield. This is a whole list of things they decided you couldn't do on the Sabbath. I'll give you just a few. They taught that you should not look in a mirror on the Sabbath because you might be tempted to pluck out a gray hair. And that would be reaping. And the Bible says you shouldn't you know, work in your field on the Sabbath. An egg could not be boiled on the Sabbath either by normal means or putting it near a hot kettle or by wrapping it in a hot cloth. Or, in other words, they had to keep adding to the application because there was a discussion. One more. It was not permitted to wear false teeth on the Sabbath. That must have been a hit in the synagogues here. And see, this is what happens when we want to debate, discuss, and argue the application. The point is, am I, are you keeping the Sabbath holy? You know, to think that these are silly, strict, or not strict enough does not change the fact that we're to keep the Sabbath holy. And on this issue, and I told you last time, I don't go into that again, it's a sensitive issue, people immediately want to begin to debate the application, and pretty soon we're not talking about the Word of God anymore. We're talking about the application. I want to give you an illustration here. Would you mind to help me for just a second, Brother Dale? All you got to do is come and just stand right here. Would, would you mind to do that? And Elizabeth, I know you're still growing, but could could you could you could you come stand right on this side? Now, I, I was hoping Becky Helfenstein was here because there's a picture of us in the yearbook from OBI. In our class, I was the tallest one, and she was the shortest. Let me ask you: Is Brother Dale tall? Yes. You don't want to debate it. You don't want to argue about it. Do you? Okay. Now you you got some time left here. You may end up six foot. We don't know. But is Elizabeth short? There's no question. But you know, I'm sorry, you got some time left here. <laughs> but I could start calling different ones up, you know. I, I, I could call, I, I could call uh, Nathan up, just come stand in the middle. Now, is Nathan tall? Elizabeth, is he tall? He's tall to me. See, yeah. <laughs> Is he tall? No. I mean, we could bring some, even no. I mean, we can bring him in here. N let me tell you what we do. I is Noah tall? Is he? <laughs> See, here's what we do on these matters of application. We spend all of our time discussing and arguing whether these are tall or short 
But the point is, we still know tall when we see it. And we still know short when we see it. You have some time left. Let me give you an illustration. Last week we talked about modesty. We can spend a whole evening arguing whether the skirt should be right to the knee, two inches below the knee, three inches below. And we can argue that, argue that, argue it. But the point is, you still know modesty when you see it. And you still know immodesty when you see it. And if a Christian would practice that should be Christian judgment of their heart, we wouldn't have these arguments. Right? Thank you. That was, that was great. Now, when I say you still know modesty and immodesty, see, I'm not talking about looking at it through worldly or carnal eyes, but when you look at it through eyes with the desire to please the Lord. That changes everything through the Word. Last week, we covered the principle of modesty. I'm not going to go over this. Just wanted to put it up there where you would see it. Women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but that which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Dress should be in order. These apply to men as well. Dress should not expose. I'm talking about the dress, the garments. Should not expose or emphasize the body. Should not, or they should be, worn with the bashfulness of encouraging lust. One's dress should not be extreme or extravagant, and one's dress should... Uh, reflect a person's desire to be godly. We're going to talk about the principle of ornamentation. Here's the scripture. This is from Peter, whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of plating the hair, of wearing of gold, or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man or the hidden person of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit. Now let me tell you something. I keep talking about principles, but to get the principle, we need to understand what is going on in the Scripture. You see, most of the time, this is all we get. We get this one verse. But to help us to understand this verse, I want to get the context, so we're going to go back to verse 1. Now I want to tell you before we read verse 1, this is an epistle the apostle is writing in response to a question or a problem or a situation in the church. Let me tell you what it was. The situation Peter was addressing was saved wives with unsaved husbands. That's what he's addressing here. You know, we always get right there to the, about that ornamentation and the gold and the ring and all the jewelry. We go right there, but we got to understand what Peter was talking about or whom he was addressing. These are saved wives with unsaved husbands. Likewise, ye wise, be in subjection to your own husband, even though they're lost, that if any obey not the word, they also may be won without the word, or without the word be won by the conversation of their wives. Now, th this is older English, and so let me, let me, just, let me just parse a little bit of that uh, for us. Okay? You're, you're a saved wife, if any obey not the word, your husbands have not responded the word to the gospel. See, this first word and second word are different, and they're different in the original too. But listen, what they're saying here, or Peter's saying here, wives, you're saved, but your husbands have not obeyed, they've not responded to the gospel, which says repent. How are you going to win your unsaved husbands to the Lord? that they may without the Word be one. It's not talking about without the Word of God. We have to have the Word of God. What it literally means here, the Word is here, they may be one without your Word, wife. Let me just put it frankly. What, what Peter was saying is, listen, saved wives with unsaved husbands, you'll never nag your husband into Christianity. That's what he's saying. They don't obey the word. They don't obey the gospel. They'll be one without your nagging them. Why don't you go to church? Why don't you do right? Why don't you be the priest of this home? Why don't you do good? Why don't you set a good example for the kids? Why don't you just get things right? They'll never be one by nagging. Okay? In fact, wives, husbands don't do anything when they're nagged. Isn't that right? I'm done, went to meddling. There's a mechanism in a man 
that the moment his wife starts suggesting that he do something, it sets in motion that hey, it ain't going ain't gonna to happen. You know, it's just the way men are built. And Peter knew that at a deep level, men cannot be nagged into Christianity. So how are they going to be one to the Lord? By the conversation. And remember, this is the old English word. Not the speaking, but the lifestyle. They're not going to be one, saved wise, with your mouth. They're going to be one by the way that you live before them. Now, there's a whole lot of wisdom there if someone has an unsaved husband, but I, I, I can't dwell there. But, but we need to take that to someone. I, I, I'm, just, I'm saying no to a bunch of stories. I'm saying no, no, I'm not going to tell them. So Peter said you're going to be won by the life. The, your unsaved husband is going to be won by your lifestyle. What lifestyle? Verse 2. When your unsaved husbands, they behold your pure life coupled with fear. Not fear of God, not fear of man, but with your respect that you have. Even though they're unsaved, you as a saved wife, you live pure and you show respect to them as your husband. Now that's the context. How are they going to be won? By a pure life. Now Peter understands how folks can misunderstand. So verse 3, where we get this verse about gold and hair, what he's doing, he's taking care of a perceived or a possible or a potential misunderstanding. He said, Whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning, adorning, the plating of the hair, of the wearing of gold, or putting on the apparel. He's afraid they're going to misunderstand him. Okay, I'm not going to win my husband by talking them into salvation. So I'm going to get all dolled up. And I'm going to move them with my feminine charm. I'll use my feminine charm to seduce them into Christianity. Have a power over them. And Peter says, no, no, no. I'm not talking about when they see you and your presentation of your body where you, where you, you ornament yourself that you can, that so, so you can turn on that feminine charm and get them to do what you want them to do. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about this outward plaiting of hair, wearing of gold. What I'm talking about, what they need to see, verse 4, is the hidden person of your heart. And that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. In other words, Christian women, you should not ornament yourself in a way that presents and projects and extenuates your body. That shouldn't be what people see when they see you. When they see you, they ought to see this meek and quiet spirit and realize that you're a godly woman. Where, where does it come from? From the hidden person, from the inner person. It's the inner person that ought to be seen on the outward person. How many really believes if somebody is full of the Spirit and has let God work in their life, how many believe that it, it shows up on their countenance? Why would a Christian woman want to have the countenance of a carnal lady of the world rather than having a countenance that bespeaks of the glory of God and the time she has spent in His presence? You see, I don't have time to go back, but we cannot accept the world's standard of beauty. Amen. I'm telling you, I know this is true. You, you, you let us have a real good service and everybody get prayed through and everybody looks beautiful. As long as you're in the Spirit. But So this principle of ornamentation, there are usually two things we think of. First of all, is jewelry. Objects of precious metal often set with gems and worn for personal adornment. That's dictionary definition. Another thing we think of in ornamentation is makeup. Cosmetics used to color the face or the nails or whatever. And you could add to the list. But that's just a simple definition. Let's take this principle of Peter and see if we can't draw from it. Or this scripture of Peter. Draw some principles of ornamentation. Now the main one again is ornament should not what what people see when they look at us it shouldn't be how we've decked out and donned the outward person it should be the inside of what god has done coming out in our outward person so that's the overarching principle first of all i think to get this principle we need to question the motive of why we wear things we shouldn't wear something to project 
ourselves, to call attention to ourselves. We shouldn't wear something to accentuate the body. We've dealt with that quite a bit. We shouldn't wear something just to call prideful attention to our position and status. Okay? You know, and, and it's all good in life. We understand this. I mean, you let a girl get engaged and she'll worship the Lord every chance she has in the church service. Hallelujah. But some people genuinely are trying to impress folks either with their status or their wealth by the jewelry they wear. That's the purpose. These are questions we should ask ourselves. Then we need to question the purpose. Is it functional or decorative? I have holiness friends that just can't imagine why I believe in wearing wedding rings. I think it speaks of the commitment of marriage. And still in our society, it makes that statement. If you're, you're, you're out, you're traveling, people look for that when you're in social settings. They don't understand. The point is, I don't wear this wedding ring for decorative purposes. I wear it because it functions. It talks about marriage and that I am married and that relationship. I used to wear a watch for I had an iPhone, and I didn't wear it just so I could wear a bracelet. I never really did enjoy the uncomfortableness of that. I wore it because it was a timepiece, and I didn't appreciate when someone asked me to look on my ticking bracelet and see what time it was. And I think this is a good principle. Is it functional or is it decorative? Is it hygienical, practical, or cosmetic? Are you truly just doing it to extenuate, or is it something hygienical? And if we, you know, if we were in a different setting, I'd, I'd give you more illustrations of this, but there are some things we do with our body that are hygienical and they're practical. I mean, I, I know one group, and I'm not making fun. Last time I said this, I kind of called on the carpet. I was not making fun, but, you know, they don't believe in wearing deodorant. Well, to me, that's a very practical thing. How many would agree? <laughs> Go ahead, worship. <laughs> Question the effect. And we, we've dealt with this in modesty, but what effect does your dress have on others and on yourself as the wearer? Does it reflect a meek and a quiet spirit? Now, I'm going to say this one more time. I say this to young people a lot. If you don't have a heart to serve God, you don't want to please God, this stuff I'm talking about seems like some of the silliest, ignorant stuff that a preacher could talk about. But if there's something in you that wants to please God, you're getting this. We don't want to wear anything that would, would, would make us look carnal and fleshly. We, we want to, even in our, in our dress, reflect the work of God in our hearts. Does it reflect the world's standard of beauty? You know this thing I gave about short, short and tall? We can argue about worldliness all night long. But if we've been regenerated and born again, we still know worldliness when we see it. And we still know godliness when we see it. Amen? It's there. I wanted to throw this in. And this, is, by the way, is five years old. Congregations that would accept a member of a cohabiting unmarried couple as a lay leader. In other words, living in fornication, but a leader in the church, 31%. Congregations that would accept a member of an openly homosexual couple as a lay leader, 23%. Now, you may say, well, that's just those liberal churches. No, this was a, a survey of churches... They've accepted this now, but they were one time churches of tremendous revival fervor and commitment. Churches that taught being different from the world. And now those churches and those statistics are higher than that now. Why didn't I say that? Because if nothing is ever taught, nothing is ever sought, it's only that close before a church that is godly, has religious fervor, believes in a difference from the world, goes way beyond arguing about the little things in the middle and pretty soon they're supporting the things that you just saw in the statistic and sometimes folks say well, you know you know why do you have those leadership standards well i'll tell you what i think they're built on biblical principles but just take a look around it is as i said 
Churches that just devoid themselves of any type of effort to be different from the world, it's not long till they're accepting these horrible things. You say amen? Question the motive, the purpose. Question the standard. Whose standard are we dressing by? A godly standard or a worldly standard? The godly standard is we should be natural. You know, God made us a certain way. The worldly standard makes folks look unnatural. How many believes that? The godly standard is that we should be attractive, not in the sense of attracting desire, but in the sense of nice and neat. We've already talked about that last week. The worldly standard is artificial. The godly standard is to be well-dressed. Paul said, be ordered in your dress. The worldly standard is to be sensual and reveal. You, you, you can say, Pastor, this is ridiculous. I, I, I challenge you, walk through the mall and look into the shop windows of the mannequins who are representing tweens and teens and young ladies and what they're putting on those mannequins and tell me that they're putting on anything, portraying anything but complete sensuality. And revealing of the body. And that is not what a Christian should be comfortable wearing. A godly standard is it's well fit. You don't have to wear a gunny sack. That's not godliness. Now I want to tell you something. If your spirit's not right as a woman, and you have a carnal, sensual spirit, you can wear a loose gunny sack and still be carnal and sensual. Right? Revealing The worldly standard is revealed. That is the purpose of dress designs for women today. It's to reveal. I don't think we have to look like we came over on the Mayflower. Right? Godly standard, you don't have to be outdated. But the worldly standard is you've got to have the latest. You've got to be in vogue. It's got to be what the movie star, the singing star wears. The godly standard is we're presentable. You know, I, I, can't, I can't chase every rabbit. There's a bunch of them jumping up. But I don't think you need to be coming to church wearing your sweats that you worked out in. Amen? Now, now look, look. I understand something. If, if that's what you were to work and you don't have time... I want you to come, however. That, that, that's, that's a common sense thing. We're not talking about that. I'm talking about people's attitude that nothing. Have you, have you been to a, a funeral viewing lately? Okay. We ought to be presentable. But the worldly standard is to be salacious. It's, 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 it's an attempt to, to trigger an illicit desire in folks. A godly standard, our dress emphasizes our personality. A worldly standard emphasizes the body godly standard reveals the spiritual intent and a worldly standard reveals the fleshly intent one of the things i get asked about a lot and i'm just going to try to answer it quickly here but anything that demands cutting the body and permanent markings is forbidden by scripture and i want to use this as an illustration of something a little later but this is Old Testament. I want to make that clear. In Leviticus, it's in 19.28, it says, Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. I love to read history books from the age of discovery. I just finished one on Magellan, who was the first to circumnavigate the globe. And I noted, as, as they made contact with people that Europeans and Christians had never been in contact before, that the things they noted about what they, they called them heathens in, those nationals, the things that they often noted is why they'd have bones poked through their nose, different parts of their bodies were cut, tattoos upon their body. And it's interesting to me that things that even Christians are promoting today. You say promoting? Did you know there's some mega churches that have tattoo shops in their little mall foyer thing? I heard one supposedly revival leader. He pointed out to young men as he was preaching, said, boy, I, li I really like that tattoo you got on there. And Christians are accepting today the things that were prevalent and rampant amongst people who had never had the light of Jesus Christ. What I'm trying to say is most of these things so accepted today, 
if you would trace their source, the source was pagan, idolatrous nations. Many of those nations involved in, uh, in, in demometry and all of that before the light of the gospel came. You know, I've always thought this interesting as far as, as tattoos are concerned. How many, if you got a new car, would go get a can of spray paint and just put some nice graffiti on that thing? Oh, maybe you'd use a stencil. I don't know. How, how many would do that to a new car? People won't do to a car what they'll do to their body. And you say, well, what's important about that? Because we're taught that our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Well, maybe you wouldn't do it to yourself. How many would like it if somebody put graffiti on your new car? Well, how do you think God feels when people do some things to His temple? And again, I want to emphasize, don't debate the application. Let's go back to the principle. Let's talk about the principle of distinction. God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he him. Them. God created male and female. Everything from the popular movies to what is taught in our university is an attempt to blur that distinction between male and female under the pretense of standing for equal rights. I believe male and female ought to have equal rights. I really do. I mean, I mean, let's, let's, Elizabeth, if you want to play in the NFL someday, you ought to have the right to do that. What I'm trying, I'm trying to make a point. They're misunderstanding something. Equal rights is not the same of folks being identical. Let me explain. Let me just give you a simple illustration. Maybe that'll help. Equal does not mean identical. This, this is something the liberal of our time and our society cannot understand. Equal does not mean identical. Here's one example here. Is I got the wrong thing. It was supposed to be a dollar piece. I totally blew my illustration. Okay. Can you help me with your imagination for just a moment? That is a dollar coin, okay? Who's who who's on it? Susan B. Anthony, is that who's on it? Okay. Okay. That's a dollar coin. How many knows that a dollar coin is equal in value to a dollar bill? But are they identical? No. Their nature is different. And if our society could just understand that when they're pushing for equality, a woman and a man, a male and a female, are equal in the sight of God, they're equal. In Christ, they're equal. But that does not mean they are identical. The problem with our society is they're trying to make them identical. And everybody loses in that little game. So, two areas of distinction usually we talk about in holiness circles. One is dress. Dress is an important means of distinguishing between the genders. Now, how many would admit you would have been a little taken back if... I was came out tonight on the platform, and I had a nice skirt on. How, 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 how? Brother, Brother Cruz, he got convicted last week. Not he says he's gonna quit wearing his kilt. That's, that's. <laughs> but how many be a little taken back? How many be a little taken back? Yeah. Why? Because we can again, we can argue in the middle here, but we still understand that some things are feminine, some items of dress are masculine. This is from the Old Testament. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord our God. Okay. Now, before you get nervous, <laughs> where you at? About the pink shirt. I, I'm going to make a different point here. Okay. When you see blue, what gender do you think of? You see pink, you think... You think female. How many realize in the early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s, it was the opposite? 
It sure was. I, I remember some of our older folks, Sister Linderman was one, she told me about this. And other, I'd read it in history books. And the reason is they thought that uh, they put pink on boys because no girl should wear something that bold and extenuating as pink. Okay? Now the point is they have totally switched today. But still, generally, we realize that there is a difference. What I'm trying to say, our garment does, our garments, our clothing, it does. And again, don't get bogged down here arguing about little items in the middle. We still know masculine and we still know feminine when we see it. Now, the first thing folks will say is, isn't that the Old Testament and therefore doesn't apply to New Testament Christianities? New Testament Christians. There's a whole series there, but let me just give you a few things. Let me show you their argument. Here's De Deuteronomy 22.5. The woman shall not wear that which pertains to a man, neither shall man put on a woman's garment, etc. Okay? But then it gives all these other things. A bird's nest. What do you do with the bird nest? Verse 9. You shall not sow your uh, vineyard with different kinds of seed. Verse 10. Don't plow with an ox and a donkey together. Verse 11. Don't wear a garment, 50% polyester and 50% wool. You know, don't do that. Uh, and then verse 12, thou shalt put fringes upon the four quarters of thy vesture. So immediately folks will say, well, this is the Old Testament, so it doesn't apply to us. Well, look, let's look at something. And again, here's the argument. If it's wrong for a woman to wear men's apparel and man to wear woman's apparel then we ought to all be putting fringes on our garments and we ought to look at the tag and if it's a mixture of materials, we ought not to wear it if we're going to take the Old Testament that way. I want to back up and to say this. When you look at the Old Testament law, it had three main elements and this is very important. If you'll get this, it'll, it'll solve a lot of issues and questions people come up with. The first element is civil. Those were laws for governing Israel and defining them as a people. They were civil law. Civil law. What to do when something was stolen. What to do about the city limits. Ceremonial is a second element. These were laws for their particular form and way of worshiping God. Many of them pertain to the tabernacle and the temple. Things they did with animals and sacrifices and all of that. But a lot of the law is moral. They were laws that expressed or maintained morality. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You know, if you're going to say a woman should wear a man's apparel, that's Old Testament, don't do it. Then what about the scripture that says thou shalt not commit adultery? Thou shalt not steal. That's Old Testament too, isn't it? So let's look at that argument. Let's say that it's valid, okay? If a woman shouldn't wear what pertains to a man then we need to put fringes on our garment. Let's, let's say that's valid, okay? But look what else besides women wearing men's clothing would be justified by that argument. Okay, this is about familial relationships. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, no sodomite of the sons of Israel. Okay, again, these are Old Testament scriptures too. If we're going to take out the one then let's take out these as well. The thing is, there's a, moral, <coughs> there's a moral point to the Scripture. Women should not wear men's apparel. Men should not wear women's apparel. So the question was, is it that Old Testament and therefore it doesn't apply to New Testament Christians? Before you get too far afield with that argument, keep this in mind. Jesus and the apostles and New Testament Christians didn't have a New Testament. What did they use? They use the Old Testament, okay? And this as well. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Another question is, isn't that a law just for the Israelites? This isn't just something God said do or don't do. We've got to keep this in mind. This is something God hates. They that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. They would cross-dress in worship of their false idols, complete perversion, complete debauchery, just like what happens in our society today when the lines are blurred. Abomination unto the Lord. This is not a ceremonial or civil law of Israel. This is a moral law. Let me show you. 
If you'll look on the board here, you'll see this clearly. Moses uses man and woman in this command instead of the pronoun thy, which refers to a member of Israel specifically. Look at 22.5. The woman shall not wear what pertains to a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. Okay? But the other verses, thou, you as an Israelite, shall make thee fringes upon the four quarters of thy vesture, wherewith thou covers thyself. Okay? So when you're talking about the fringes, that's Israel. But when you're talking about woman and man, that refers to woman and man in general, humanity. A question I get a lot is, should a female wear pants? Can't pants be a woman's pants? Now, again, I don't want you to argue this application. I just want to tell you how I answer that and how I see this principle apply. The point is, is that there should be a distinction recognizable to the society. And don't forget, it should be modest as well. Note the symbolic recognition. On this question, really, we have to understand that in our culture, pants are still a symbol of the male and the skirt of the female. Don't we see this? Don't we immediately know what this means? That recognition is there. It is a vivid distinction. Notice also what we have in our society. We have this characteristic thing. And I'm not trying to be funny. I'm just showing you, show you how this is in our society. We still have this remembrance. She wears the pants in that family. What does that mean? She took charge. She took the headship. She took the position of authority. Note the deportment reinforcement. I used to have young ladies that were honest, you know, and this was a struggle. But I, I've had it when they, at, at points of honesty, they told me that when they wore a dress, they acted differently. They sat differently. Another area of distinction is the hair. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him, but if a woman have long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Now, we could spend a lot of time here, but let me just briefly tell you what's going on. When people became Christians, they realized that a lot of just tradition and culture was just that. It had nothing to do with their spirituality. And one thing women realized is that wearing of a veil or a head covering, like Muslims do today, they realize that's just a cultural thing. So they just showed up at church one day, and they didn't have that little veil on. And, and I mean, false? No, they didn't wear false teeth. Remember? But anyway, mouths were were gaping open, and and you know everybody was getting upset. And so they wrote to Paul, "What are we going to do? These ladies have taken off that veil, that head covering." And basically, here's how Paul handled that. Look at the last part of this verse. Her hair is given her in place of a covering. What Paul said, literally, God had already given women a covering. It was her hair. She did not need a veil. She did not need Because God had already given her a covering. So really, really, your ladies don't need to be wearing a veil in church. That is just culture. That is just tradition. In fact, he said in verse 16, he said, We have no such custom, neither the churches of God. What he means we have no such custom is we don't have the custom of just letting the hair be in the covering. Our custom is that you wear a veil. Therefore, just because that's the custom, not because it's mandatory to wear a veil, but because it's a custom, go ahead, don't pray or prophesy women unless you wear that veil. Be respectful of that culture. Now, this is in America, but... Uh, when I, I spoke to the Slavics the other day, as soon as the ladies came in, they put a head covering on. That's, that's their culture. If I had been a lady, <laughs> that's just a long stretch, but if I had been a lady and I was speaking to them, especially if it had been back in their country, I would have went ahead and put that on as a lady just to respect that culture. That's what Paul's saying. But he makes clear that this about long hair is not culture. It's what? Doth not even... Nature, In other words, the way God created, male and female, He created this. So, so that's what was going on there. I like what Brother Branham said about the veil thing. He said, if I'm lying in bed, whether I'm covered with a sheet or a sheet and a blanket, either way, I'm covered. In other words, that's what Paul's saying. God provided the hair for the covering. Men wanted to add the veil as part of the culture. So a woman's to have long hair, and a man is not to have long hair. It's a shame unto him. 
long as a covering. If we had time, we'd go to all these verses. Paul appeals not to culture, but to nature. If you knew the stories and things I was having to avoid to go on tonight. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame. I've always thought this was interesting too. In Revelation, when he was describing these beast if you'll call them that that came up out of the pit look what it, the description they had hair what kind of hair hair as hair of what women so it was descriptive why is it when society grows rebellious so often the genders reverse their hair lengths from that which is prescribed in paul's writing now i want to pause for just a moment for this thought holiness is is a matter of the heart. I want to tell you this. I was going to give you a slide. I don't have time, but let me just tell you this. If we put all these applications and standards in the center, we've missed it, we'll dry up, and we'll just be a man's culture religion. It'll be a different culture than our society, but it'll still just be culture. In all of these things, in the church, in our hearts, in our family, Christ goes in the center. We can make idols out of these things that we feel strongly about. And you can tell tonight, I feel strongly about it. We can make idols of them. Christ is what we worship. Christ is the standard. And if anyone begins to feel pretty, pretty holy for, because you've got a handle on some things other folks don't, before you measure yourself in the mirror, why don't you just go and stand in the presence of Christ and then ask the question, how holy am I? How many has ever had those moments when you thought you were doing pretty good, then you got in His presence? He's so holy and pure and righteous and kind. So holiness is a matter of a heart. That's right, but people use this truth to claim holiness has nothing to do with externals. They use that truth to protest if anyone says anything is wrong. They use that to assume that the heart is easier than the externals to get right. Let me tell you this, and I don't have time to get into it. But I tell you, I wish it were just the externals. I'm going to tell you why. It's a whole lot easier to take care of external things than it is internal things. I've never had a battle with wanting to let my hair grow long and braid it. I've never had a desire to have a ponytail. But I'm telling you, that thing called impatience? Whew. Oh, my, I done went to metal. Nobody has a problem with impatience or anger. Or... To make no attempt, folks use this as an excuse. It's just a matter of heart. To make no attempt to live separated from this world. It's the Spirit in Christ that should separate us from the world. Holiness is a matter of the heart. Therefore, to have holiness, it must matter to my heart. Does it matter? Does it matter to God? Does it matter to the Bible or in the Bible? Does it matter to the world? Does it matter to me? I want to tell you one thing. The world knows how we ought to be living. I've heard them on public radio call in and ask why those Christians on Christian television were dressed and acting the way they were dressed and acting. I'm talking about rank sinners that never went to church and they say, Christians shouldn't be doing that. You can point out the hypocrisy if you want to. But I think the world wants to see a difference in us. You know, if the world doesn't see a difference in all of our lives, why would they have any reason to believe that the gospel we preach could change their life? Wow. I was watching a documentary on deep sea cave diving how many ever seen any of this I mean those things go deep when they get in there no one else has been there there's not currents these are like sinkholes in the oceans in different places and islands and when you get in there just the movement of their body the pre change of pressure of the water will stir up this silt and totally it will have a blackout just the movement of their body will cause rock that's been hanging for centuries to fall on them. It's extremely, extremely dangerous. And the, the labyrinth of these tunnels goes for miles and miles and miles under the ocean. It's deep down. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but the best diver always goes first 
and he lays a line kind of like they do in normal caving he lays out a line as they go and everyone that follows him down into that tunnel every one of them never lets go of that line if they do they're in trouble you can be lost in just a second it was real moving because in what I was seeing, they had went way down this tunnel and suddenly there's a diver's suit and it's lodged up against the wall with the top part up into a crevice. The guy was trying to escape. And the narrator said, I can tell from this, the, the, the equipment and stuff, this is a diver's suit from the 70s. And it was still all there. The suit was there. Even the arm was reached up like this. The head had fallen off because of the composition, co- composition because of the decomposition. And but there, there was the there was the suit like that. And he was trying to get out through that crevice and didn't make it. And the man simply said that said this. He said, "Back then, they didn't use this line. They didn't use this line." I want to tell you when I, when I saw that. That's what the principles of God's Word. I mean, getting through this life, this life is a labyrinth of tunnels and dead ends and dangerous places. You can get lost in a hurry. One wrong decision and your whole life changes. But I see the principles of God's Word like that line. If I can keep my heart, my hand, on the line of the principles of God's Word, it can get, there can be a blackout. Things can fall on me. I can, I can get panicked. But if I've got my hand on that line of God's principle, I'm going to be safe. I'm going to come out of there. Amen? Now, you, you may travel a little bit on the other side of the line than I do. In other words, Brother Brian, this may be the line right here. You're on that side and I'm on, I'm on this side. But the point is, do we both have a hold of the line? We may not agree just, just perfectly on every little point. But the question is, are we both have a hold on the line? I am so thankful for the principles of God's Word. You want to know why we have the mess in our world? They're not following principles. They're doing what is right in every man's eyes, as it says in the Bible. And I want to tell you, the moment that hits a Christian, it don't matter what the pastor thinks, it don't matter what my parents are saying, I'm going to do what I want to do. You have quit living by principles, and you've started living by what's just right in my eyes. And it's destructive. I wish I, wish I had a picture. If you could see that guy trying to get out, and a man said the simple reason he never made it, is he didn't have a line that he was holding to. Hold to the principles. Let God speak to you. Don't say, well, you know what Pastor Hurst said. I don't believe that. That's not the point. Get the book. There it is, Peter, Paul. Get the book. Get the principle. And say, God, what is this principle of safety that you've given me, my family, and the world? Amen. Amen. Sister Hurst, would you come? Come ahead, music. I got a little song I want us to sing. I, did, was you able to find that, guys? Would you stand? Would you ever find it? Okay. How many remembers this old song? We shout when we sang this, didn't we? You know what Peter said earlier? He said, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims to abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. Hallelujah. We're pilgrims and strangers. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. 
If heaven's not my home, oh Lord, what can I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. My Savior, pardon me from guilt and shame, I know. I'll trust His saving grace while traveling here below. I know He'll welcome me at heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what can I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore this world is not my home I'm just a passing through my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue and the angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore oh Lord you know I have no friend like you if heaven's not my home then Lord what will I do the angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can if you feel that way why don't you come singing amen mm. oh Lord you know amen just come fill these altars say thank God I've got that line to hold on to I can hold on to that principle hallelujah oh from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore this world is not my home I'm just a passing through my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue and the angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world If heaven's not my home, 